but there's a team in China, I think, that have also done this with ultrasound to allow you to touch holograms. So if you um, think of it, the, um, uh, the, the sensors on the hologram system could actually detect where your hand is, and at the moment your hand reaches the spot where it should be touching the little holographic image, ultrasound waves are emitted right into your hand in the spot where that image would touch your hand, creating this, the feeling of touch. So what might be much more realistic than trying to create this squid device uh, would be to simply make a holodeck from <laughs> Star Trek, which would actually be way easier. Um, not easy, <laughs> but way easier um, using the uh, ultrasound haptic technology, uh, maybe some non-bulky version of the taste technology, uh, and then allow you to see the memory and interact with it dynamically instead of just having to play it back like a movie. So squids, not real, but I say true-ish because this idea is pretty much real. Uh, there's an NPR podcast called Invisibilia, and on one of their episodes they talk about a woman who has this neurocognitive issue where her mirror neurons fire much more dramatically than otherwise. So like if she sees someone get hit, she like feels that. Um, and so you might really be checking that out. <laughs> and like, if you could do this in like a neurobiological way, oh, if you that would take a lot of the devices out of the question. Yeah. Well, I mean, it would, it would require a device to do that. Um, well, or but, like a pharmaceutical. Well, yeah, a targeted pharmaceutical. Yeah, maybe <laughs> So if we're using our imaginations, totally possible. Yeah. Um, okay, so, yes, but no. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, mind uploading a revision. So I put a revision because this was actually in the presentation that I gave last year. Um, not exactly as I presented this year, obviously. This is why it's called revision. Um, but the idea that you could upload your mind. So in the 1982 movie Tron and the 2004 movie Transcendence, these are two sort of ideas of being able to take a human consciousness and upload it into a machine. Uh, so what do you guys think? True or false? <laughs> Who thinks true? Right now or in the future? Um, both. <laughs> who thinks true? <laughs> and who thinks false? <laughs> okay. So you both are right. Um, <laughs> true for worms, but not for humans. <laughs> Sorry. So last year in this talk uh, that I gave, I equivocally, unequivocally said false. This is not going to happen. This is too complicated. Turns out I was wrong. Um, so this guy, Dr. Kenneth Hayworth, uh, this is his life's passion. He wants to basically, he has developed an idea for a process whereby when somebody dies, their brain, their brain is immediately plastinated. So it's injected with these resins and it's immediately preserved. Um, then take it and take these tiny little slices out of it. And every time you take a tiny little slice out of it, take a picture. You could then layer those pictures together and create this 3D model of the brain. Um, he wants to then map all of the connections in that brain uh, and this is called a connectome. A connectome is just a map of every single neural connection, maybe even the vasculature of your brain. Um, and he is convinced that if you could then take all of those circuits and the way that they connect to one another, and, uh, and you know the rules about the way that those circuits interact with one another, you could then create a human emulation in uh, a, computer, a computer. So <laughs> the idea is a really good one. And there's no flaws in the idea, except the, the non-feasibility of some, due to some obstacles. Uh, one obstacle of which uh, is that we haven't actually mapped a human connectome, um, and it would be very difficult too, because uh, the amount of storage space we would need to put all that information is just colossal. Um, there are so many connections. Uh, another is that we don't really even know if we have anything with the processing power to make this work, and then if we did, what would that look like? Um, so addressing the first issue, we haven't mapped a human connectome. We haven't mapped any connectome except this guy's connectome. Um, this is a tiny little worm. This is uh, the scale of one millimeter, um, named C. elegans. Uh, and C. elegans has roughly a thousand cells, and it has the unique uh, characteristic that every adult C. elegans has exactly 302 neurons. So we have mapped those 302 neurons in the connectome of C. elegans. It took researchers 12 years to do that. Um, now, uh, having a little bit of comparison, humans have about 100 billion neurons. So it would take us an incredibly long time to be able to build that connectome. Um, there, uh, when I gave this talk last year, 
somebody uh, said, okay, fine, we don't have the human connectome, so we can't put the human, make the human em emulation, but if we have the connectome of this guy, why don't we make a C. elegans emulation? And uh, I didn't know the answer to that question last year, but after some research, it turns out that some people are doing that. Um, so this project called Open Worm, uh, mostly they're trying to create uh, a computer simulation uh, based on the circuitry and the rules guiding that circuitry um, in the, the C. elegans worm, and they've actually gotten pretty close to this worm that could theoretically behave independently and do whatever it wanted based on its own neurons. Um, they also wrote a program that uh, was guided by the connections of these circuits and by the rules that guided these circuits. Um, and built a Lego robot that would then be run by that program. And when they played it, it behaved exactly like a C. elegans worm would behave. Um, there's certain uh, behaviors when it runs into things, it will back up and then it'll get out of the way. If you touch its tail, it'll move forward really fast. Um, they had you know, iterations of taste receptor or food receptors that, uh, uh, food sensing receptors, um, that when they activated those, it would go towards the food source. Um, and so that, kind of gives you hope for the idea that this could be possible um, if we had a human connectome, theoretically. Um, there's also a citizen science aspect to this project. So if you go to openworm.org, they're looking for people from all walks of life to help with different aspects of this project to try and make it happen. Um, and there are not people, there are people who are not swayed, or dis dissuaded, uh, by the idea that this is gonna be so coloss colossally difficult in mammals. Um, the, Mouse Connectome Project is a team that's currently trying to map the connectome of a mouse. And again, they have a citizen science aspect. You can go on mouseconnectome.org and try and help them out. <laughs> and still, there are people who are convinced this is possible in humans and are not giving up hope and keep trying. So this guy, Dr. Sebastian Sung, his parents were philosophers. And so he comes at this from this very science, philosophy, joined marriage sort of viewpoint. Um, and he actually has a really interesting TED talk called, I, I think it's called I Am My Connectome, which is his philosophical ideas basically on why this would work and why we are our connectomes. Um, and he actually run or leads this group uh, called iWire. iWire, uh, it's a website you can go and play a game, an interactive game uh, that helps you, or that in which you're essentially mapping the neurons in a retina um, and you're helping them with their project in mapping these neurons while you're playing this one game. So, uh, mind uploading. Uh, uh, yes, possible for this worm. Yes, they have a crude emulation of this worm. Yes, it behaves the way a worm does. Uh, but is it the worm? And not with humans. <laughs> we have so many obstacles before we do with humans. Okay, so you could you could um, slice the brain up and, and upload its structure and connections. But wouldn't the connections be changing so much that you couldn't um, get? The actual like memories? So yeah, so the our brain, the connections in our brain change on a moment by moment basis. Like if I sneeze, I have destroyed like a hundred synaptic connections in one little tiny place in my brain because of the concussive force of my skull against my brain. Like every single second your synapses are changing. Which is why Dr. Hayworth's idea of immediately plastinating the brain when you die would preserve everything all at once in one moment in time. Theoretically. I don't know how well that would actually work. <laughs> So it, it sounds to me like he's mimicking both the hardware and the software of the brain or the worm or whatever, right? I think that's his goal. I don't know. I don't know if his methods would work, but I think that's his goal. Which I think the biggest hurdle is simply that the human brain is so complex in uh, in size that once we got all of this information, which would take a really long time, could we store it anywhere? And then could we even have a computer that could run that emulation? Like that's all a lot to conquer first. Uh, in the 1997 movie Gattaca, 
Uh, people live in a world where all children are born through in vitro fertilization. Uh, parents go to a clinic where they can select out of the group of embryos that they uh, have fertilized, which ones have the best genetic traits, which ones don't have any disease. They can choose eye color, they can choose gender or sex, uh, and they can uh, pick the best possible version of their child. Uh, the movie is about this guy who's actually a natural born person in this society and is a second class citizen due to that. So is this possible? Could we do this right now or in the near future? Uh, with humans. Who thinks it's true? Who thinks it's false? Wow, yeah, you guys are good. <laughs> so, <laughs> true. <laughs> um, but I don't think this is a good thing. Uh, unfortunately, the fact that it hurts my feelings doesn't make it not true. Um, so, we have uh, what is called pre implantation genetic diagnosis. This is not something that's theoretical, this is not something that just works on mice, this is actually something that works in fertility clinics, and they're using it now. Um, this is questionably legal, um, in, but still uh, actually practiced in many states, even within the United States, where we have some pretty stringent ethical guidelines for ours, uh, for this kind of stuff. Um, so what this is, is it, it involves in vitro fertilization, just like in the movie, you have to have in vitro fertilization to actually use this process. Um, you, the, you go into the clinic, they'll combine a certain number of your eggs with the sperm, and get uh, a bunch of fertilized oocytes, and then they go, they, they wait a uh, number of days until these oocytes grow into this uh, maybe eight to 10 cell ball. Um, and then they take this little vacuum thingy and they suck out one of those cells. Um, so they, uh, at least in practice, uh, and claim that this doesn't affect the future development of the uh, embryo, which I mean, these people grow into normal humans, so it probably doesn't. Um, but we should probably research that. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> after they've harvested this one cell out of each of those embryos, uh, they basically run a genetic analysis. They look at the DNA, they see do you have any diseases, they can tell the gender or sex. Um, they can tell whether it's a boy or a girl. Uh, they can tell a whole host of other traits. Uh, and they give this information in most cases to the parents, who then choose which one or which several of them they want to implant. Uh, and then the rest are discarded. And so, and I don't mean to misrepresent that, in in vitro fertilization, many end up discarded anyway. Um, so, in thinking about the ethics of this situation, uh, some researchers, I think in 2008, published a study, a review in the uh, Journal of Fertility and Sterility to see what the prevalence of this kind of stuff actually was, how often was pre-implantation uh, genetic diagnosis used, and what it was used for. Um, and so the things that they found were actually a little startling. In 9% of all the cases that they studied, they uh, were cases in which parents used this not to screen for any sort of health defects, uh, but used it to screen for uh, sex, to pick whether or not they could have a boy or girl. Um, in 9% of cases. So most of the cases were, you know, screening for does my kid have cystic fibrosis or any of that. Um, but 9% of cases to choose whether or not you can get a boy or a girl. <laughs> um, in 1% of cases, they were screened for HLA type, which is basically like your immune type, um, so that they could have children who were the same immune type of their previous children who were sick, so that those children could grow up and be tissue or potentially organ donors for their sick children, and they called these savior siblings, uh, in 1% of all of the cases of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In 3%, this is the most troubling one. In three percent of them, the parents had screened for a genetic, uh, a deleterious genetic mutation. So, let's say both the parents had dwarfism, or both the parents were deaf. They screened for children who also had those traits. Uh, so, ethically, very questionable. <laughs> um, I uh, would not <laughs> uh, like to live in a world where all babies were born that way. Um, so this is not, like I said, this is not <coughs> theoretical. This is applied. Um, but what about the possibility of looking at those embryos and looking at the genetic information in those embryos and then changing it to be what you want? Not taking a list of all, all the things that were made naturally and picking the best one, but making the best one. Um, I would have said two weeks ago, <laughs> no. Um, but this week, actually Wednesday, this was published. 
um, a group in China actually applied a very sophisticated gene editing system to human embryos. Uh, this research would not be uh, legal in the United States, uh, but they have um, less strict ethical guide guidelines in China. Yeah. Well, maybe you're going to say, I don't care about the ethicalness of one person compared to the idea that they're putting it into the replication so that you have tons of people with whatever they come up with. No, you only get one person, but you get one person who passes that along in their gene. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Um, so their, their progeny will have these, yeah. Um, so basically what they use is this thing called the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, gene editing system whereby you can create these synthetic RNAs uh, that can guide other enzymes into certain places in your genome that have genes that you want to change, um, and then those proteins come along and change those genes. Um, and what they found was that this system is not very, uh, as it stands, not super effective in humans. I think they only got genetic mutations in about 14% of the embryos that they tried this on. Um, and some of the embryos that it did work on were mosaics, so out of that cluster of eight cells, maybe only six cells actually had the mutations that they were supposed to. Um, but they kept saying over and over in this paper that, uh, you know, oh, we just need to do a lot more tests and get this into a sophisticated system so that we can apply this clinically. Um, and so that just, you know, opens up <laughs> all of the ethical questions about this. Uh, yes. You're only creating one individual, but you are affecting their germline. All of these progeny, all of their progeny, will have these mutations that you introduce into them. You're technically affecting the evolution uh, of that. Uh, you're, you're technically affecting evolution actively in that one person. Uh, and so, that's a good game, guys. You were really good at this. <laughs> all right. Oh, and I also I do I do want to point out um, that some of these have been oversimplifications, and I urge you to go back and read the papers that I mentioned. <laughs> Okay, questions? Yeah. So I am going to um, add an extra slide at the end with all the references to the papers that I mentioned and then uh, email it to the person who upload, uploads it onto the Penguin website. So that you can all read those papers. <laughs> See how scary the future is. Have you read uh, Sandberg and Bostrom's uh, Whole Brain Emulation Roadmap? No. <laughs> it's all about the highly recommend it. number four and <laughs> creating human brain emulations and, and what steps need to be taken to get there and some estimates on how long it might take for the technology and computing power systems. They're talking well, there's about estimates? Like 2045, 2055, maybe they could they could upload a brain. Wow. I, I didn't even know it was that soon. Well, well of course that's hopeful. But it, <laughs> it's a whole brain emulation roadmap by Sandberg and Boston. I just read a couple weeks ago. It was really fascinating. So, yeah, so yeah, I think, you know, if we could solve those hurdles, it would totally be possible, for sure. <laughs> well, what do you think about if there is brain emulation about the idea of cloning somebody's brain as opposed to their body? Yeah, so that, that also, you know, begs all those philosophical questions. Is the connectome actually the person? Will that connectome in the emulation act like that person? Just because it has all the same circuits and the same rules to guide those circuits and the same memories as that person, will it follow the same traje trajectory as that person would have? Right. Probably not. Who knows? <laughs> Is there any um, discussions being had about, so like we were showing with the C. Allians, how that was kind of behaving like the organism, but say you do this with a mouse or a monkey. <laughs> Yeah, and mean, all of a sudden now, now you have to consider that an individual. Right, how you right? treat it as that. <laughs> you have to get that thing right. Like. Especially if it, if it has pain receptors and yeah. things like that. Like, what yeah. are the ethical guidelines? Well, it's not like, like, like scientists are all that nice to mice anyway. Yeah, do you like well, rights? Well, 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 with research, you have to go through <laughs> a certain protocol. You, you know, you yeah, you probably have to write all these rules. But then, you know, you have his AI.
So part of the thing at PenguinCon is getting uh, like robotics and getting the brain to communicate. And you're using these big MRIs to you know figure out what's going on in the brain. What's the current status on getting better machines to find out what's going on in the brain? So there was actually a lady who did a talk here, I think yesterday, about the future of neuroprosthetics. Um, and she is actually uh, a researcher at the University of Michigan and does this for a living. And she mentioned in her presentation a lot of that stuff. I think maybe she'll have one um, <laughs> She said she was, I think her last name was Justin. Yeah, okay. So I've got that one. Right. But yeah, so uh, she addresses a lot of those things and answers them probably in a way more sophisticated way than I can. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like you could do EEG headsets for some of this stuff. Um, uh, some of them involve implantations. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a really great answer. <laughs> Data. Uh, it was an episode of Star Trek. Data there. Uh, it was a machine told you by the Federation. Oh, I remember on TNG. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was a really good episode. They, well, they ended up considering him. Basically, he just said that. What about the new testimony? I have heard, and we have not any new follow up, but we have many neurons in our testing that we do in our brain. Uh, well, this and is more meditation and yoga lately to be put to go shopping. And I've actually experienced that a few times in the sense that I'm starting to wonder because you're old. Your emotions come from the lower region of your brain. Well, the big, brain big, yeah, so the vagus nerve stimulation actually is very yeah. well, even though it doesn't connect to any of the normal. So well, part of this is like I can feel emotion actually in the intestinal function. Yeah, it's really like, has anyone ever done a few like an MRI, FMRI, a whole new system? You know, I'm sure there are things out there. There's none that I've personally read. Yeah. Um, it seems like the intestines may have a, a very odd function. I mean, it's not the logic that you only think of, but it might almost be more of an emotional system. Yeah. I, unfortunately, that 